Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching the number one site for learning bass online for bassplayersonly.com, where I've taken the frustration out of learning bass so you can build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy making music. It's not for everyone. It's for bassplayersonly.com. We have a very special guest this week. My my old friend. Well, not that he's old, but by you know, I, he's been a friend for a while. <laughs> uh, Mark Damon of the Pretty Reckless. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great, John. How about yourself? Good. It's so good to see you. We did an interview at the 2016 NAM show. Then we did another one about a year and a half later. That's when who you selling for without a question mark was the, uh, the latest record. And since then death by rock and roll has been released and the band has been on the road with a whole great big bunch of touring dates planned. So how are you feeling these days, Mark? Oh man, it feels so good to be back to work. <laughs> everybody says that. Everyone means it. It's been a tough couple of years for everybody. Yeah. I bet you're excited about playing in New Hampshire in July. Definitely. Yeah. It's a kind of homish town uh, show. So uh, it's good to be back in the area you know, where I grew up and whatnot. So that's one of three states I, I haven't been to. I've been to Massachusetts. I've been to Maine. I've been to Vermont. I've been all around there, but I never made it to, to New Hampshire yet. That and Oregon and Alaska. Those are uh, Alaska's Alaska. on my list too, for sure. Yeah. There's something I, I, I want to get to early. I don't want to say like get it out of the way, but there is something I want to address. Uh, the last time we did an interview, we were on the pretty reckless band's tour bus outside the Fox theater in yep. Detroit. And that was just before your show with Soundgarden. You know where I'm going with this. I and uh, I, you know, only a few hours later is when Chris Cornell took his own life. And I'm, I'm, I just, how did you guys get through that? And how did you manage to keep going after that event that just shocked everyone? Ooh, that's a tough question, John. Um, well, first off, let's just say that touring with Soundgarden was a definitely a dream come true for everyone in the band. Uh, there, there are heroes and, um, to be able to tour with them and get to know them personally was just amazing. Uh, so going from you know the highest high to the lowest low in a matter of hours was uh, a shock to the system for literally everybody involved who ever, ever knew Chris and who was able to you know be in his presence and, and to experience his artistry. Um, it was a huge blow for us as a band. <clears throat> uh, it was really tough to to continue going on and. We tried our best. We did, uh, that's even hard to remember. Um, we toured until December of that year. And then pretty much we were, we needed a break. Uh, well, what happened? Like, well, I think we met in the summertime when that happened or, or spring or something like that. So were you scheduled to play again, like the next day or next you know, couple of days later? We were scheduled to play some festivals uh, with, um, was sound great. That was the last uh, headliner show we were doing with them. Uh, they were the, they're the, they're the clear headliner we support act. Uh, we we're scheduling at least one more festival, I think. Um, and we were, we were talking about, you know, getting back together and doing something else with them later in the, you know, in the future. Um, obviously that didn't, didn't come to fruition. Um, so that was obviously May. Um, and then we did some summer festival stuff. Um, you know, uh, and to some U.S. things, then we went over to um, Europe and UK, to stuff over there, and, and finished up in Paris in December, uh, early December. Uh, and then we all kind of really needed a break. Uh, the, the tour cycle had kind of come to its natural end, anyways. In a way, um, we may have gone into the next year a little bit more had things not gone the way they went. But um, then we were, you know, planning on doing a new record once everyone had had time to really you know, collect themselves and process what we'd all been through. I I'm sorry to, to bring you down. I just, I wanted to to hear about that. I, I, I thought I would do it early in the interview rather than end on a downer. So oh, I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let's switch gears. Tell me about the new record death by rock and roll. It's uh, certainly getting a lot of attention. Yeah. It's been amazing. Actually. Uh, the, 
the reaction to this record has just been incredible from the fans and from you know our fellow musicians have really been into it as well, which has been great to see. Um, it's, it's a rock and roll record. It's uh, you know Ben and Taylor did an amazing job writing. Uh, Taylor's voice is just fantastic. Um, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a uh, it was a tough record to make. Uh, we had lost our longtime producer Kato Kandwala uh, about a year before that, and um, again another blow for for the band and uh, trying to regroup and we're all going through, you know, our grieving process uh, and trying to find our, find our way. Cause he was such an integral part of, of our records and of the band. Um, he's really the, the fifth member of the band. So it's making this record was a real tough ride. It took a long time, took over a year to make. Um, it was a battle uphill battle. A lot of times I think you can hear that in the music. Uh, some of the, anguish and some of the uh, you know, cathartic you know, moments of the record uh, breaking through uh, to new, new places, you know, new emotions. Um, so I think it was an important record for us to make as well because uh, it was the first record we made without Cato, uh, the first record that ben, that ben and Taylor really produced themselves uh, along with our friend John Weinman who was engineering the record up in, in, a, in a studio in Maine. Um, and so it was a new, you know, new footing, new direction, you know, some uh, expanding people's uh, abilities and, and comfort levels of what they're, you know, they're used to doing. And uh, I think Ben and Taylor found some really uh, amazing things out about themselves, uh, progressed as artists, uh, as producers, as writers. Uh, and, and we really uh, came together as a band and, and created something that I think we're all really proud of. Well, I, I like what I've seen some YouTube videos. The video production is great too on those. They, Thank uh, you. Um, you spoke very highly of Cato in uh, one of the previous interviews. And yep. I, I did want to ask you about him because somebody you knew was about to do a recording and Cato was going to be the producer. And I think he asked, you know, how should I prepare for that? Or what kind of advice do you have? Mm -hmm. And uh, these are your exact words. Uh, what you said to me in the interview, what you told this guy, uh, you want to sit there with a metronome and you want to play a bunch of stuff and you want to record yourself and every mistake, every tweak, every weird thing, you need to fix it. Every pitch bend, every missed fret, any note slight off the metronome. Uh, I, I don't want to scare anyone away from learning bass because that's <laughs> what we do here at, for bass players only. But that I found that somewhat inspiring I, I guess it depends on how you look at it it could be inspiring or it can be intimidating or it could be fear inciting but yeah. uh I, I i wanted to to bring that up so how how did you manage to uh get through what you were just explaining to me did was that in the back of everyone's mind how many times did, did you think well what, what would cato say what would cato do that was said a lot uh and the, one of the great things about working with Cato and the toughest things about working with Cato was that he had a ability to hear everything that was going on. Every, he was like, his ears were like a microscope. You didn't get away with anything. Um, and if you were trying to do something that wasn't dead on, it had to be intentional and there had to be a reason for it, uh, which makes you think about how you play differently and how it also, you know, helps you really get down to the nitty gritty of, of what kind of player you are, where you are, you know, your weaknesses lie and to, you know, build those up to become a better player and a better musician. Um, he really elevated everything he came about, you know, um, everything he touched, he really elevated uh, much to, you know, some of our you know, frustration at times, <laughs> but it came down to, he was usually right. Um, and that was a, a tough lesson to learn. It's like, oh shit, you know, maybe I'm not the badass I think I am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, as you said, you can take that two ways. You can either let it break you down and, you know, say, you know, hell with it, I'm done. Or you can use it to inspire yourself to get better. And one of the great things about the Pretty Reckless is this band has always been about making ourselves better, pushing each other to really elevate our, our art and what we're able to do individually and collectively. Um, so that was definitely, you know, a huge part of what Cato did for us and, and with us. Um, Doing this record without him, I found and and passed and after that, I found myself kind of reevaluating reevaluating the player I am and the player I want to be, and taking some of the slop I used to love for a reason, 
and bringing it back into my playing. Um, so you, you know, building upon the foundation of, you know, the meticulousness that he had and forced you to have with the, you know, the more raw uh, punk rock, some of the R&B slop that I, you know, that I love uh, from, my, from my history and the music that I, I play uh, apart from Pretty Reckless, kind of brought that back into, into my playing and kind of refi- refining wh- what I am. Um, it was a long process of working with the Pretty Reckless and so coming from, you know, the, the dirty punk rocker, you know, kid, you know, not you know, knowing exactly, oh, that, that causes the pitch to bend too much. Oh, I shouldn't do that. To, oh, I can play dead on, but maybe that's a little too sterile. How do I bring some life and some meaning back into those notes and some me back into those notes and to, to, to elevate the music? I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember, I, I often think back when I was about 19 years old, and I think it was one of my first times in a real live recording studio, and we were laying down some demos. I don't remember exactly what the project was, and the engineer played it back, and for some reason, I remember he soloed the bass track. And That's I, frightening. <laughs> I didn't even, it, frightening is, is not even strong enough of a word for how I felt, and it was I, I remember thinking, what, what is that? I, I didn't even know it was the base. It was, it was so God awful. You wouldn't believe it. I, when I think about that, I don't know what made me continue to, to learn and to pursue a career as a professional bass player. <laughs> but yeah. That experience helped me a lot with all the, the books that I've written and all the, the tracks that are on there. Uh, it, it's funny because I've spoken to some of the most recorded bass players in music history they've played on I, I i won't mention their names but i asked more than one i said what well, what if something sounds good when when you hear it with the whole band but if you isolate the tracks that there's something not right does that ever happen oh it happens all the time and and uh, you know the, the producer or whatever will say well you know you can recut your track if you want but you don't really need to so with all the stuff that i did I, I didn't know about, well, I don't, know, I don't want to sound like I'm saying I didn't know that was okay, but when I did <laughs> all my books, my, my 10th book was just published this year, and, and I lay down bass tracks on those, and I, I, for a lot of them, I, I think you, you can isolate the, the uh, bass on one side, and you can turn it off and hear just the rest of the band on the other. Yep. So I knew that people could hear everything, and that just forced me to learn to play everything super clean, and, and when I did the... The Jocko books. Oh my Oof. God. The play That's like heavy, Jocko, man. play like Jocko Pastorius. And I'm in the middle of recording that. And the, and the publisher, Hal Leonard, reached out to me and they said, put that one on hold for a minute because we have another Jocko book. It's a Jocko play along. And we want you to play all the tracks on that. And then you can go back and finish the other book. <laughs> so there was a little bit of overlap. I think probably Teen Town and Birdland. And I don't know, but there was like Dry Cleaner from Des Moines, the Joni oh, yeah. song, and a few others. But oh man! But anyway, uh, so yeah, I know what you're talking about. But uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a, a, a bass instruction site for bassplayersonly.com. So this this is a good segue to my next question. What advice do you have for someone who wants to learn bass? Most of the people I attract are men. We get a fair bit of women, but men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, they're not trying to be rock stars. They're not looking to make a career out of making music. They want to play some some classic rock riffs with their buddies or some blues shuffles or maybe a little slapping funk R&B, walking bass line, something just for fun. So in that context, how, how would you advise them? What, what do you think is important for someone like that to know when they want to learn bass? I actually get this question a lot from, uh, from fans online and just, you know, random people. Um, and from age, you know, nine to age 89, 99, uh, I always tell us it's never too, you're never too young and never too old to learn to start playing bass. Uh, it is, uh, it's a lot of fun, man. You know that it's so much fun just laying it down behind a drummer, you know, just grooving along. Um, Take your time. Be easy on yourself. You you don't have to you don't have to play Jocko. I can't play Jocko. I'm impressed with people who can, John. Uh, I love Jocko's playing. I I didn't knock it all out in an hour, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And and like I'd come up from the basement. I'd be shaking my head. My wife said, what's the matter? I'd say, 
Jocko. <laughs> it's and it, it's segue into that. It's great to have heroes. I think we all have musical heroes, and, and you know, whether they be bass, guitar, whatever. Um, and it's okay to try to emulate that, but realize that they're them and you're you, and that's okay. Um, and that's great. That's actually what makes it unique and fun is that no two players will ever play the same thing the same way. Uh, and that's the beauty of it all. And uh, I think that the trap, I see a lot of young players and I don't mean like age, I mean like beginning players uh, fall into is, you know, well, I'll never be as good as so-and-so. Uh, so what? Do you enjoy what, doing what you're doing? Are you making progress? Uh, are you having fun? Uh, that's what, what the real gauge is. Um, if at some point you decide to become a professional is, you know, again, are you making progress? Are you having fun? Are you enjoying it? Uh, if you're not enjoying it, why are you doing it? Okay. What's the point? I mean, it's, it's base. It's not like, you know, uh, brain surgery, you know, it's not a life or death situation. You're supposed to be enjoying this. And, uh, I enjoy myself every time I pick up an instrument, uh, whether it's be in the studio, whether it be on my my, my uh, couch, you know, hanging out, whether it be on stage. I just love doing what I do. And I, hopefully that comes out of what I do. Um, and it should come out of what you do as well, whether it be playing with, you know, on your couch, along to records, by yourself, in a garage band, in a classic rock cover band, in a semi-professional situation, whatever it is. You know, enjoy yourself. I mean, this is... Dude, we get to make an inanimate object sing. How incredible is that? It's super incredible. Now, speaking of basses, so tell me about your, your basses and your gear and effects and all that stuff. Oh, oh we're great. getting into the nitty gritty fun stuff now. Yeah. I'm really lucky. Uh, I think, John, you know that uh, being a professional musician is, is like having a small business. It's uh, you know, a lot of relationships and you know, a lot of you know, uh, costs. Uh, to, for equipment and supplies and whatnot. And I'm really lucky to work with some great people and have some great people support me in, in my, uh, my quest to get on, out on stage and have fun and make a fool of myself. Uh, <laughs> I have a couple of great um, custom builders these days that have been hooking me up with some great instruments. Uh, recently, my number one uh, stage uh, uh, bass is a bass from a company called 52 Custom Guitars, a really good friend of mine, Ralph Napolitano. It's a, uh, I actually have it right here. It's a, a telly style you know, neck top there. 52. Uh -huh. And uh, it's a, just a simple, it's got a DiMarzio 60s P in it. And it's just, you know, the two knobs, four string, but the neck is just, it's perfect, man. It's just, it sounds so good. It feels so good. It's a great weight. And it's a, you know, as a friend of, my, friend of mine who built it for me. So it's, I'm really lucky. He knows what I like. And uh, my friends at Brimstone have hooked me up with some great instruments as well, some great basses. Um, luckily, the people at Fender have been really taking care of me for years. I Billy Siegel. For, I was waiting for you to mention Fender. Uh, Fen I mean, I'm a Fender guy. Uh, everything yeah. I base my, my basses on it is based from Fender. For Leo Fender got it right the first time. Everything else is kind of like a in my you know, guitar arsenal or bass arsenal. Uh, arsenal is, uh, is very much based upon the Leo Fender design. Uh, it's where I feel most at home and most comfortable. Um, so those are those my main bases, the Fenders and the, the 52 and then the Brimstone. Uh, all strung with GHS Strings, another company who's oh, yeah. been really great to me. John Moody, as you know, is just a wonderful person. Yeah. Uh, another you know, guy who knows so much. Yes, the bow tie man. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful guy. It's been yeah. really, really great to me uh, over the years. We like to geek out about you know gear regularly. Yeah. Um, for for amplifiers, yeah. I'm using uh, a Heritage Ampeg Heritage uh, SVTCL. I just picked up from a, a friend of mine in Florida, a guy named Jimmy Miller, who's a bass player down there, who's just a you know uh, an Ampeg aficionado. And he hooked me up with Dino, the Ampeg Dino, guy. Who actually Dino Monoxilis. Lives, lives like the one town over from me. We never, all these years, we never knew we lived like literally 20 oh, minutes. Dino? Yeah. So we, we have coffee on regular. You know, he's, uh, he's hooked me up with some really great stuff. You know, he's hooked me up with my, uh, my PF50 T back here. You know, you can see it. You know, sort of my I studio. Dino. I interviewed yeah. Dino at a Summer Nam show one time. He's great, isn't he? Love Dino, yeah. Such a great guy. And this was uh, right around, uh, it was shortly after my big fat Greek wedding had come out, that movie. And yep. I said, did, did you see that movie? Could you relate to that at all? He said, I lived that movie growing <laughs> up. 
another guy with great stories, man. Oh yeah. yeah. We just sit, we have coffee and we just laugh and chat. It's a, he's a great, great guy. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, I'm really blessed to meet all these people and, who you know, have been really supportive and helpful. Um, the people at hip shot have also been great to me for you know, tuners and detuners mm-hmm. kind of a, a staple on all my instruments is the, is the drop D tuner. Uh, so yes. we do a lot of things in drop D's Josh and uh, yeah. And J- Jason look over there has, has been really, you know, yeah. supportive of me in the band. Yeah. Um, and the, and actually my friend, friend, Michelle over at Ace products, who was hooked me up with the reunion blues line of gig bags and whatnot. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, she's also hooked me up with a, a company called Gravity Picks, which I just started using. They're kind of an ac- acrylic uh, guitar pick. And I got this really thick two millimeter one that's, it's really nice. It's uh, It doesn't catch on the strings at all. It's really smooth and it doesn't really bend. It just like, boom, it, it really hits it nicely. They have a nice. Are you, are you more of a pick player than a fingers player? I go back and forth. Let's Sometimes piss some people off here. Come on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. There's you know, two schools at times, but uh, how many strings should a bass have? Let's... <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Let's not get into that. <laughs> um, no, I, I even switch between, you know, pick and, and finger style in the middle of songs. It's really what the, the music you know calls for. So what else is happening with the band? I mean, uh, the, the latest record came out, I think like a year ago, February or something like that. So, yeah, we were, uh, we were about to release it right before pandemic hit. We had a, uh, a tour booked starting in April of 2020 and the record was all set to be released and then the world shut down. Uh, so we sat on it for a while. We're like, well, what are we going to do with it? And as the thing dragged on, we're like, you know what? Let's just put it out. We want to put it out. We want people to hear it. So we put it out and uh, it did great. You know, hit number one on Billboard and had several number one singles. And Good while we were you. sitting at home on our couch, you know, <laughs> doing next to nothing, um, trying to stay healthy. Uh, so we're looking at, I think we're all itching to get back in the studio and do something. Uh, when that'll happen, I don't know. Uh, I know Ben and Taylor have some songs they've been, you know, kicking around and writing. That's what I was getting at. Writing. There, there must yeah. be something percolating. Right? Yeah. It's it, with those two, there's always something happening. They're just such creative and prolific, you know, writers and just artistic people. It's just, it's come so naturally to them. It's awesome. Um, I yeah. don't remember if I asked you this either the other two times or not, but I'll ask you now, what would you be if you weren't a bass player, something outside of music. I know you played, what you play trombone? And then I think you played a little saxophone and yep. some other things, yep. but so outside of music, what would you be? I'd be very depressed. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't know, actually. It's a very good question. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, I was obsessed with archaeology, you know, Egyptian, uh, the pyramids. And uh, I always thought about maybe being an archaeologist. I think that'd be kind of fun. Uh, I got another, uh, I could dig that profession. Another profession where you go away from you know extended periods of time and to strange places and, and live you in missed squalor. my really really bad joke or or did you just ignore it? Oh, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? <laughs> I said I could dig that, and then I went. Oh, like that. bad joke. Nice, dude. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, and it's very exciting. I'm glad you're back on the road. Enjoy the tour. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Enjoy. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person soon and often. Thank you, John. John, appreciate it. Thanks so much to our special guest, Mark Damon of The Pretty Reckless. I'm John Liebman. You're watching the number one site for learning bass online for BassPlayersOnly.com, where I've taken the frustration out of learning bass so you can build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy making music. It's not for everyone. It's for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman. I'll see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you.